The portion of Mark's gospel that was proclaimed this morning brings forth for us that moment in which Jesus and the disciples are arriving at Caesarea Philippi. He has been out preaching. They've been out doing miracles. They've been healing people. They've been proclaiming all kinds of things. And as Jesus is, is going to Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, he kind of turns to them the way that um, sometimes you have people who are in any kind of leadership checking in with the people around them. So how are we doing? I remember a long time ago, the mayor of this city, Mayor Koch, used to say, used to start off every one of his news conferences that way. So, how are we doing? Pretty miserable, Mr. Mayor. But, um, <laughs> however, Jesus is asking his disciples, how are we doing? What are people saying about this? He's checking in with them, and the scripture writer, Mark, is very succinct. He kind of gives us this quick answer, and then there's the dialogue that follows. Now, I want to share with you that in preparation for this morning, there are at least, and I'm not joking, at least eight good sermons to preach from that little portion of Mark's Gospel. It's chock filled with all kinds of things for us to consider as the people of God. But this morning, I would like us to focus on that question. Who do people say that I am? Now, I want to give you one more moment of confession. If I were a very smart man, I would let that epistle reading that was read so well by young Mr. Griffith as, as to stand alone at reading from the letter of James to be the gospel, the, the sermon today. And so for those of you who've got those bulletins in your hands, my recommendation for your Bible study this week is that you take that piece from, from the letter of James home with you and you read it again and again and again. And remember how wonderful that young man read that piece of scripture this morning. But no one said I was smart either. So I can continue to preach. Who do people say that I am? Jesus is checking in with his disciples. And then the question for us as we gather today, particularly in this setting, when we're going to do the baptismal covenant, we're going to make, we're going to renew our baptismal vows, particularly with those who are going to be confirmed and received, calls into question what is it that people are saying about who we say Jesus is. My pause is not because I'm trying to think about the next thing I'm going to say. My pause is to have you think about that question for a moment. Who do people say that Jesus is? And I'm going to add, because it's the context of our bridging the gospel passage to our lives as Christians, who do people say that Jesus is when they encounter you? What is the experience of God's people when God's people experience those of us who call ourselves Christians? And more importantly in this community, when people encounter us as members of the Episcopal Church, and particularly in this parish, when they encounter us as members of St. Joseph's in Queen Village. Now, I need to tell you that I set up one of your choir members today. Somewhere under there, there's a tambourine. And as it was being slid under, I said, well, let's not get too excited here with being joyful. And we have this little dialogue that goes back and forth because one of the things that happens is that you know that most times in most of our communities, Episcopalians are uh, thought of as being a bit staid. That certainly there might be an organ, there may be some other instruments, but tambourines? <laughs> 
so I'm already encouraged by what people may be experiencing of this congregation in terms of who we say Jesus is in the midst of this community. So who do people say that Jesus is when people encounter you? And my reason for pausing again is for you to think about this. My reason for wanting you to think about it is because this parish has a rich and long and faithful tradition of being the faithful people of God in this community. And we need to continue that tradition. We need to do it in ways that build upon the good work that you have done here, that you've been a part of, in terms of your proclamation of the gospel in this community. But in order to do that, we each need to check in with the amount of fear that we carry. You see, too often, I believe, and this may not be true here at St. Joseph's, we Christians live in fear. The world around us is starting to move in on us. It's harder and harder to get our young people to remain part of the faithful life of the church. We're struggling with the ways in which we pass the traditions for, that we grew with on to the next generation. Let me tell you, that's a losing proposition. <coughs> We're going to pass on the spirit of the tradition, but the church is not going to look like it used to look in years to come, the way we remember it in years past. And we just need to know that that's the same thing that happened when we were the generation that was up and moving and coming along from the generation behind us. And they scratched their heads, particularly when we decided that it was time to change the prayer book or to change the hymnal. Every generation of Christians needs to be equipped for that moving forward. But we know what it feels like, don't we? It's harder and harder to be the church in the midst of our communities. And we tend to think that the world is getting more and more secular. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is checking in with us. Who do people say that I am when they encounter you? When they encounter your church community? when they encounter your expression of faith? How is it that in the day in and day out of our lives, people understand our relationship to Jesus Christ and somehow are transformed by it? Jesus was walking along and they're going to Caesarea Philippi and it was the, begin the continuation of this mission and Mark records to us this conversation because I think Jesus was beginning to understand that the disciples weren't getting it. They thought they were on some kind of victory tour. They didn't realize what was coming. They didn't realize that they were going to have to roll up their sleeves and be the church. They didn't know that there was going to be crucifixion and then resurrection and then ascension. And the church was going to be left being the body of Christ. Who do people say that I am? So I'd like you to think about this for a moment. Off to work on Monday morning, getting to the bus or the subway, driving in on one of those wonderfully clogged arteries going through the city. Who do people say that we are? How is it that we witness? How is it that we stand ready to be the body of Christ within the, in the particularity of a tradition of the incarnational love and grace of Jesus Christ? Who do people say that we are? Too often, other Christian denominations say, well, those Episcopalians, all they know how to do is fight. They'll fight. You got, you got three or four, I, you get three or four Episcopalians together, you got at least ten, ten opinions. 
If there's something that should be bringing us together, it is the unity of the witness of our inclusion and our diversity and our spirit of accepting God's people as they are. But rather than understanding that as a strength of our understanding of being the body of Christ, we tend to go back to those days in Paul's time when he encountered the church that said, I have no need of you. That's not who we are. That's not the tradition of our church. It is not our inheritance as the people of God. Who do people say that you are? How is it that we give witness to our understanding of Jesus Christ in the world around us? From Paul's writings and the, and the epistles to the early churches, that you, you, we can't all be feet, and we can't all be hands, and we can't all be heads, and we can't all be ears, although some of us try. The diversity of the body that we celebrate allows us to be the people of God. The fact that we can worship together, that we can pray with and for one another, that we can care for God's people in the communities in which we find ourselves, makes all the difference in the world. And so you want to argue about those particular things that may divide us? We can argue about them for as long as you want. But as we're arguing about them, let's keep moving on and feeding God's people and teaching God's children and worshiping God in our churches. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in our words, but by how we live. And how we act. And how we embrace each other and not disenfranchise each other. When I hear Christians say, well, I don't want any part of those people. I'd like to have their membership card back on Christianity. When I hear people say, well, unless you say such and such, you are not a Christian. I want that membership card back. Because in the body of Christ, there is no east or west, north or south, black or white. There is no one kind in the body of Christ. There is all kinds in the body of Christ. Who do people say that I am.